This lecture will cover Strongyloides stercoralis. The nickname we usually use is Strongy. I'm Dr. Paul Pottinger. The objectives for Strongy are to understand the life cycle so that you can break that cycle, know who gets it and where, but please be able to make the diagnosis. You have to recognize the clinical presentation with special attention to the fact that in some cases, patients with strongyloides will present in a very delayed fashion, and it could be catastrophic for patients who are heavily immunosuppressed. You need to know how to make the diagnosis and become familiar with the principles of treatment. So here we are on the map of life. Strongyloides is one of the GI roundworms, and this is its life cycle. It starts very much like what we see with hookworm. Someone's walking barefoot through contaminated soil, and there are microscopically small infectious filariform larvae that will burrow right through intact skin when it touches the soil. And then those uh, larvae will make their way under the epidermis, through the dermis, into the vascular blood supply, into the right side of the heart, and get pumped out into the lungs. In the lungs, they will behave very much like what we see with Ascaris or with the hookworms, where they mature in the high oxygen tension. And just like with those worms, after a period of time, they are coughed up and then swallowed and make their way into the bowel. But that's where things get different. This is the worm that breaks all the rules. Because this worm, as you can see in this uh, panel right here, does not have to make its way uh, out into the environment to do its job. What happens is that these larvae will mature in the small bowel and then as adults burrow into the wall of the bowel, lay their eggs right there. And in the wall of your bowel, those eggs will embryonate, they will mature, they will hatch into rhabditiform larvae. Those rhabditiform larvae then cruise out of the bowel wall into the bowel, into the feces. And by the time they've reached the rectum, they are filariform or infectious larvae. So when the patient defecates, it's not eggs that are being passed, it's infectious larvae. And those larvae may then either burrow right back in through the skin of the perianal area after someone wipes themselves after defecation, or sometimes they don't even need to get outside of the body. They'll burrow right in through your rectal mucosa. We call that auto-infection, and that concept is so key because this is what distinguishes strongyloides from all the other worms we've talked about. It's also possible, of course, to spread this to other people. That's called the direct cycle. In fact, strongyloides is fascinating. It doesn't even really need people. We hypothesize that there is a free living cycle in the soil, but eventually these worms seem to want to get nourished on human flesh. Uh, and so people probably are required for this infection. It is an anthropinosis, closely related to the human hookworm. Again, skin penetration, not oral. It does have a lung phase. This parasite is different. It does not need to exit the body to complete its life cycle. That's called auto-infection. So what's the epidemiology of strongyloides? It happens throughout the tropics, just like all the other GI nematodes that we have talked about. All you need to get to become infected is poor sanitation, warm weather, and bare skin that comes into direct contact with soil that has been uh, infected with human feces. Tens of millions of people are infected. There's a strong burden among those who walk around in the tropics without proper shoe gear. So how does this present clinically? The paradigm is that early illness happens when there is skin and lung migration, and later illness will correlate with the degree of immunosuppression. The more immunosuppressed, the higher the worm burden in the gut. So early on, we do have a rash. The rash is called larva currens, and it's quite reminiscent of cutaneous larva migraines, except that it's much more evanescent. It is a shorter-lived rash, intensely itchy, also mediated by IgE and histamine in the tissues. The difference is that this uh, infection uh, only lasts for a short period of time, unlike cutaneous larva migraines that last uh, for longer. Uh, and once those larvae will enter the circulation and they migrate to the lungs, the rash tends to simmer down in a matter of hours or just a few days. So once those larvae reach the lungs, it's just like Ascaris, it's just like hookworm. Most people have no symptoms, but once in a while, someone will really truly have a cough or wheezing chest pain, even coughing up of blood. That's because there is an IgE-mediated immune response that recruits eosinophils into the lungs. That eosinophilic uh, granule that is released by the eosinophil cell will cause inflammation in the lungs. 
You might see eosinophils in the lungs. You might only see the Charcot Leiden crystals that tell you that there are eosinophils in the sputum. If you snap a chest x-ray at the right time, you might even get fooled into thinking they have a bronchopneumonia. Yes, we call this Luffler's syndrome. Now, what happens when patients set up a GI infection? Most people with GI strongyloidiasis have no symptoms whatsoever, but among those who do, there may be nausea, belly pain, diarrhea, and this may persist for a matter of years or for a matter of decades, even after people have left areas that are highly endemic, even if they're living in a so-called developed setting, they may still have subclinical asymptomatic GI strongyloidiasis because of that auto-infective cycle. And that's a big deal because once those patients with auto-infection have depletion of their T lymphocytes, reduced immunity, they can develop a catastrophe which is called hyperinfection. Hyperinfection happens when immunosuppression is very heavy. This could be after solid organ transplantation, SOT. It could be after chemotherapy, CMT, for cancer. It could be a patient who has rheumatic illness and needs corticosteroids. It could be someone with uncontrolled HIV or human T lymphotrophic virus. What happens here is that the worms reproduce faster, and they can also migrate out of the gut, out of the lungs, to other ectopic sites. The brain, uh, the spleen, the skin, the eyeballs, the liver, every place. And then when they do that, they will carry with them on their surface the fecal bacteria that normally lives in the gut. When that fecal bacteria gets into the blood, the central nervous system, the peritoneum, the lungs, that causes infection, which causes sepsis, which frequently causes death. The x-ray I show you here shows a patient with bilateral uh, interstitial looking infiltrates, lungs that are whiter than they should be. That white is not good. That's cells, that's fluid, that's blood, that's bad, that's sepsis. Please, please, if you take nothing else away from this lecture or this whole module, do not miss hyperinfection with strongyloidiasis because these patients really do respond better with very rapid treatment. So how do we make a diagnosis? First of all, in patients with chronic auto-infection, ask them about a rash. Do they have larva currents on exam? Have them drop their drawers, look between their butt cheeks. If they have this kind of an itch, itchy rash there or on the anterior abdominal wall, that's larva currents. These patients will usually have a blood test that's positive for high levels of eosinophils. That's eosinophilia. That's common, although it's not required, but if it's there, it can help to confirm your suspicion for this. And what do we do? Sometimes these patients will have diarrhea. They might go to colonoscopy and have a GI biopsy. Sometimes the tissue will give you the answer. In the panels I show you here, we have microscopic worms seen on a biopsy of a patient's bowel wall. Or in the bottom panel, someone's checked a fecal ova and parasite, and they've actually seen the worms themselves. Unfortunately, ova and parasite testing for this worm is often falsely negative. The worms are hard to detect because they're usually few in number. Nevertheless, you can look for the larvae in the stool. The negative predictive value is only about a coin toss. Do not give up looking with a single ova and parasite. Rather, send a blood test. This is a germ that goes through the bloodstream, an ELISA, an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, IgG test, or serology. If your patient has a good immune system, this can give you the answer. And it makes it different from many of the other GI worms we've talked about. So that's for auto-infection, but in hyperinfection, things are much more serious and acute. Think about hyperinfection with patients who have gram-negative rod sepsis, gram-negative rods in their bloodstream, pneumonia, or meningitis. They usually do not have a high eosinophil count. That's the whole problem. If they had high eosinophils, they would not have hyperinfection. So don't be led astray by lack of high eosinophilia in hyperinfection. You should look for the larvae not only in the stool, but in the sputum, because these guys are reproducing right in the lungs, not even having to go down to the bowel. Uh, the picture I show you here are, uh, comes from an autopsy of a patient who recently passed away of this, uh, and you can see that the sputum was absolutely packed with these worms. Serology, not helpful in hyperinfection. The result will come back much too late to help, and the negative predictive value is very poor. What we have here is a video that we recently had from sputum on a patient who was dying of this condition, uh, leaving Southeast Asia and getting treated for chemotherapy. This was not considered ahead of time, and this patient uh, developed hyperinfection and did not survive. So how do we treat? First of all, uh, treatment and prevention come the same way when it comes to chronic autoinfection. Kill those worms. Now, for reasons we don't understand, 
Ivermectin is better than albendazole for chronic infection. The key is to make the diagnosis before you immunosuppress that patient so that you can get rid of their worm load and prevent hyperinfection. And of course, break the transmission cycle. Better public health, good sanitation, going to villages and periodically giving doses of ivermectin to kill any worms that have gotten into their system, and of course, giving people good shoe gear. In hyperinfection, things are different. At this phase, we do give ivermectin, but it may be too little too late. These patients often do not respond to therapy. By convention, we'll usually add albendazole on top of ivermectin, not because it works, but because we can and because we have very little else to offer these people. We have to reduce their immune suppression. Uh, we have to treat their HIV. We have to treat their HTLV. Most importantly, we have to manage the complications of sepsis. They need to go to the intensive care unit. They need to be on broad spectrum antibiotics for gram negative bacteremia or for meningitis, etc. Many of these patients will not survive. So that's the key concepts for strongyloidiasis. It's a roundworm infection, sort of like the hookworm. It does go fecal to soil to skin. It does go through the lung, but it also has auto-infection, unlike the other worms. It happens throughout the tropics, especially in young kids. Make a diagnosis looking at uh, larva currens. Think about this with Luffler's syndrome, eosinophilic pneumonitis. Understand that many of these patients will have GI upset, and when people come in with pneumonia and sepsis and have lived in the tropics and are immunosuppressed, think about hyperinfection. You may see the rash, you may get an eosinophilia early on, and later in hyperinfection, check the sputum and the cerebrospinal fluid looking for larvae. We treat with ivermectin, that's our best drug, and we always try to prevent this in populations by getting better sanitation and shoes, and in individuals by giving preemptive treatment before they become immunosuppressed. Thank you for your attention.